The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. We've been hearing Rob Portman's name thrown around as a potential safe vice presidential pick for Mitt Romney. And uh, even though Portman, the Ohio senator, said that uh, he is probably going to, quote, end up staying in the Senate, a number of people looking at Wikipedia edits are saying Portman is going to be the guy. Now, what does that mean, Wikipedia edits? Here's the deal. Sarah Palin's Wikipedia page was updated at least 68 times the day before John McCain announced that she would be his vice presidential running mate. 54 changes were made to Sarah Palin's Wikipedia page in the five days prior to that. Compared to Sarah Palin, Mitt Romney, Kay Bailey Hutchison, some of the other potential McCain vice presidents saw very few changes in the, in the days leading up to that announcement. Now, people have been measuring how many changes are being made to the different potential candidates' Wikipedia pages, and Rob Portman is way ahead, Lewis, way ahead. Is that, but that's not a definitive yes? No, well, we, he hasn't made the announcement right. yet, but it's an interesting indicator to look at. Now, what's even more interesting is what are the changes that are being made? In other words, what is being cleaned up, scrubbed, touched up about, about Portman's Wikipedia page? Well, I went in, and it's very easy with Wikipedia to look at a history of all the edits that have been made, Lewis, as you know. I went in, there's one user which made a number of, basically uh, removed a bunch of stuff from the page flat out, okay? Now, usually the reason that this user gave was that the, the comments were either unsighted, there was no citation for them, or they were not particularly relevant. Well, what are some of them? Let's look at them and see if we can see a trend. Now, remember, the criticism of Portman is that he's basically a Bush administration flunky, He's against any kind of government subsidy, that he is a deficit increaser as well, which is certainly something that, while is not, at least when you ask the Republicans, not as associated with Republican administrations, if you actually look at the numbers, particularly George W. Bush, explosion in the deficit under George W. Bush, something that Republicans would want to distance Portman from for sure. You ready, Lewis? I'm ready. Okay. Number one, it was removed from Rob Portman's Wikipedia page that he spent $650,000 in his primary campaign, but only $81,000 in the general election. Okay. It was removed that Portman later served as director of the White House Office of Legislative Affairs until 1991 when he went back to Cincinnati. It was removed that Portman entered a special election to fill the seat of Congressman Willis Gradison Jr. of Ohio's 2nd Congressional District. Uh, it was also removed that Portman was a member of the Committee on Ways and Means and Vice Chair of the Committee on the Budget. It was also removed from Wikipedia that in a special election, Gene Schmidt, mean Gene Schmidt, was elected to fill Portman's seat. And it was also removed that in 2006, President Bush nominated Portman to be the Director of the Office of Management and Budget. What's, the, what's the, the common thread here that you see between all of these removals on Wikipedia, Lewis? Um, that he is unreliable? <laughs> I don't know. Well, no, I mean, uh, the, the common thread I see is that a lot of these things have to do with associations with uh, past Republican administrations, particularly George W. Bush. That's what I see. And also, interestingly, that in the special election, it was completely bogus, nutty Congresswoman uh, Jean Schmidt that was elected to fill Portman's seat. That's the trend I see there. Another user on Wikipedia removing a bunch of other stuff, including one interesting paragraph which talks about Portman voted for the Ryan budget, which seeks to reduce the public debt by 10% by 2050. The proposal includes plans to replace Medicare with a system of private insurance vouchers, reduce federal employee pensions and food and medical assistance for the poor, and broadly cut federal spending, except where, Lewis, the defense budget, of course. Uh, that was removed because it was supposedly not notable and not it doesn't stand out. Well, that's pretty notable to me. It, again, is more of a tie of Portman to George W. Bush-style policy. So we're seeing a trend here in what's being removed from the Rob Portman Wikipedia page. We're also seeing just a wealth of edits being made maybe a suggestion that Portman is going to be the Romney vice presidential pick. Could be. I, is that a good thing for, for Romney? I mean, how does this really pull in the people that, that he needs to win over? I think it's a safe choice. In other words, it's the idea that it's not a choice that's going to be compelling to a lot of people. It's not a choice that's going to be a turnoff to a lot of people. Maybe it'll help in Ohio because that is Portman's state. I think it's just seen as kind of a safe, milk toast choice to counter 
picking somebody like Sarah Palin. Yeah, I mean, I guess in that respect, it's a good choice. But uh, isn't Obama ahead? Right. Well, that's the thing. Is it, if if you believe that Romney is behind, is it going to help him pull ahead? I would say probably not. But maybe the idea is to make the VP pick a non-factor. Right. Okay. Ann Coulter says that President Obama's base is quote stupid single women. Let's listen to what she had to say on the Sean Hannity program about this, Lewis. I, I am very interested uh, interested to see what this is all about. Let's take a listen. That's true. You can always nail the Democrats on that. Um, I think it's probably a good sign that Obama is so desperate just to get the base Democratic voter, stupid single women, to vote for him. This is good news that hmm. he needs to lock up that part I mean, of the Democrat vote. It's not $3,000. We found birth control pills available for women for $9 a month. Yeah. Condoms are very inexpensive. Oh, yeah. No, Daily Caller did one, I think, at Target or Walmart or something. It was, it was like Walmart. $7. dollars yeah. Um, <laughs> no, but the... <laughs> I mean, he, he is trying to get the st stupid single women voters, which, which is the Democratic Party base. Um, and I would just say to the stupid single women voters, your husband will not be able to pay you child support. What ah, okay. Now let's talk about that a little bit. I would say to stupid single women voters, your husband will not be able to pay you child support. Now, if you're single, do you have a husband? Interesting. I don't know. What do you think she maybe meant by that? ex-husband future husband i don't know again more nonsense from ann coulter um what what is with uh fox news continuing to think of ann coulter as what, what would we say qualified intelligent uh eloquent on a lot of these issues does the fox news primary audience really like seeing ann coulter there is ann coulter considered a thinker by the right her entire career is just based on shocking comments and that's it. It doesn't matter if they're valid, intelligent, well thought out, or accurate. She says shocking things. People keep having her back. Natan, do you think that Ann Coulter is seen as a thinker by the right? Um, I think that it's just an irrelevant question. I think Fox News hires her to come on their shows because she's very competent at getting high ratings for saying crazy things. Okay. Entertainment. Maybe it's as simple as that. Remember when Ann Coulter said that our blacks are better than their blacks, referring to black Republicans over black Democrats? That was an interesting, that was, that was very philosophically uh, um, uh, a strong type of, of statement. I mean, she clearly put a lot of thought into that. That's yeah. that deep, th deep thought. Very deep. Brilliant. Brilliant. It's uh, reminiscent of Stuart Smalley. Stuart Smalley? What did Stuart say? Well, you know, the, the, what was that, the name of that segment, Anton, on SNL? Um, I forget, but I remember the, uh, the movie made about it was called Stuart Saves His Family. <laughs> <laughs> was, okay. was this Al a straight-to-DVD movie? Oh, no, I'm confused. It was Deep Thoughts with Jack Handy, wasn't it, on, uh, on Saturday Night Yeah, Live? that was something totally different. That's something yeah. totally different. I'm getting mixed up. I'm well, getting my... those are old skits. You're allowed. There you go. A father waterboarded his daughter, who was 11 years old, four times while the mother stood by. Here's the shocking thing. He's a pediatrician, 58-year-old Melvin Morse, who has appeared on Oprah and on The Larry King Show as an expert on near-death experiences. Can you believe this, Lewis? So how did this, uh, how did this get uncovered? Did the mother finally go to police or something? Uh, no, no. The mother actually has been arrested as well for, for her part in this. Um, this, this is incredible. Uh, the girl and her sister, who's five, were interviewed after neighbors told police that Morse had uh, been seen dragging the daughter across the driveway by her ankles. More investigation turned out that uh, Morse allegedly ran the girl's face under a running faucet four times for as long as five minutes. Essentially a waterboarding type thing. The body feels the same as with waterboarding as if you're drowning. And it's, it's interesting because as a guy who was considered an expert on near-death experiences and, and the feeling that one is going to die, it almost seems like this is some kind of sick fixation where he wanted to give his daughter a, a quote, near-death experience. I mean, it seems almost like this, this is almost even bordering on a fetish of some kind. That's exactly what it sounds like, yeah. I don't know how else to, to describe it. He probably, he probably feels that uh, everyone should have one of these experiences and somehow... Uh, his daughter needed more than one of them. He was originally arrested on July 12th and he was released on $750 bail. Then both Morse and his wife were arrested for the second time on August 7th, just a couple days ago. They're both facing charges of, of reckless endangerment, conspiracy, and endangering the welfare 
of a child. Of course, the state attorney general's office is filing an emergency motion for the suspension of the medical license. Can you imagine going in, your kid has a, who knows, a cold, your kid has the flu, and a guy who waterboards his daughter is telling you how and you should care for the kid the and, and drags her around the driveway and her, by her ankles. That's the guy who's, who's taking care of your child. It's horrifying. I can't even imagine. I wonder if he'll be back on Oprah. Yeah, I wonder if Oprah will have him under on. Under different pretenses, Under, under very different circumstances, yeah. for sure. No longer as the expert, but more as the kind of like the Ted Haggard, uh, mea culpa type of interview where we're going to figure out exactly what the hell he was thinking when he procured that meth right. from the uh, male prostitute or whatever it was. We'll figure out what was Morse thinking when he dragged his daughter around by the ankles after waterboarding her. At least, we could, what can we say about this that's positive? At least we can say maybe it's a success for the child protective agency that was involved here, right? I mean, a lot of times agencies like this fail to uh, uh, actually follow up on some of these rumors or reports or call-ins, and, and whether it's because of limited resources, you can only follow up on so much, and as we know, funding is, is constantly decreased for these organizations or for whatever other reason. Arguably, it was a success that they got the daughter out before more damage was done. I don't know. Look at this. You're not going to believe this. Some of the books he, he authored and co-authored. Oh, it's incredible. Yeah, give us okay. the, the titles. Okay. The title of this one is Closer to the Light, Learning from the Near-Death Experiences of Children. Yeah. He's an expert on it. And he's yeah. clearly doing tests on his own daughter. And... Uh, transformed by the light the powerful effect of near-death experiences on people's lives it seems like a sick guy very like really sick. D disgusting guy yeah okay monday at 3 15 p.m eastern after the show we're hosting a members only call-in okay so this is going to be through spreecast which is a new platform that we're testing people will be able to call in we're going to have a roundtable discussion here members can ask questions definitely sign up at davidpackman.com slash membership you'll get of course access to the roundtable conference calls with us, but also you get the bonus show on today's bonus show hosted by producer Lewis. We'll talk about an Olympic spectator arrested for not smiling. It's an incredible story. Also, GOP Congresswoman Marsha Blackburn refuses to even acknowledge that Romney Care exists. It's incredible. It's She got the redirection part right of the PR tactics, but she didn't get the contextualize the transition, contextualize the pivot right, and it came out to make her look completely ridiculous. And we'll also talk about the NYPD's new crime fighting system on today's bonus show, davidpackman.com slash membership. Let's take a break, Lewis. We'll be back with plenty more after this. The David Pakman Show at davidpackman.com. Welcome back to the David Pakman Show. It's Thursday and joining us is Dennis Campbell for World View with Dennis Campbell. Dennis is editor-in-chief of UK Progressive Magazine, also author of the book Egypt Unshackled. Dennis, we're getting kind of into the uh, last throws, as it may be, of the uh, 2012 London Olympics. And we've been getting a lot of emails on the show about, we understand that during the Olympics, the immediate area has all the restaurants full, all the hotels are booked, etc. But what is the broader economic effect of having the Olympics in one city or country, not only in outside the immediate area during the Olympics, but also after the Olympics have come and gone? Well, give us a sense of what's going on in London now, at least. Well, good question, because they've really uh, been suffering. If you're not inside the Olympic Village or inside the, the sealed off zone, your chances of developing any business have been virtually zero. Um, the way they've uh, uh, addressed this and said this to people in the area is that, look, there's going to be you know millions of people coming and descending on London. If you don't need to be here, leave. Well, people took that very seriously. Anytime there's a major event, even as far west as here as Cardiff and the stadium, where we've had several of the uh, soccer matches, uh, there have been huge signs warning of traffic and delays, and it's almost as if the entire country has gone on holiday. And it was so bad that the uh, Telegraph yesterday 
ran an online feature with about 18 or 20 different images showing normally crowded summer street scenes and restaurants and even the West End theaters are down something like 12 or 13 percent. Uh, it's a ghost town unless you are at an Olympic venue. So if you're watching something like the triathlon in Hyde Park, they were 10 and 12 deep there, but every place else there's been virtually, it's been virtually a ghost town. And that's really been affecting the way uh, in which the whole Olympic experience has been because there were a number of businesses, restaurants, hotels that were counting on increased business that didn't get it. And now talk a little bit about after the Olympics have come and gone. I mean, in certain cities and countries, we've seen the issue of these incredible facilities that are built specifically for the Olympics basically be left completely abandoned and actually sometimes create less than ideal neighborhoods surrounding those facilities, the, the complete opposite of what you would hope would happen with some of the development that goes on for the Olympics. What's the plan in London as far as the venues and as far as uh, some of the development and planning that took place? What's going to happen in the five years that follow? Well, I toured the facility well in advance. Uh, I toured it just before the uh, stadium was handed over to the Olympic Operating Authority. There's been two stages in this. There's been the, the, the development and the building portion of this, and then there's been the actual handing over for the, the, the conduct of the games. And uh, when we were there, we noticed that some of, these pro, uh, some of these projects were legacy projects, meaning they were going to be around for some time. The uh, velodrome for the cycling will be the National Cycling Training Center, and it's been put to very good use with a number of medals there. The swimming center, they'll remove those two huge wings holding something like 15,000 people in seats that are <clears throat> essentially straight up and down nosebleed seats, and that will become the National Swimming Center. There's been a lot of debate over what's going to happen to the Olympic Stadium itself, and as of this writing, I'm not certain it still has a tenant. They're trying to convince one of the, the, the local London Premier League football clubs to come in and take it over, in which case they'll take off the upper deck and just use the, the lower deck of the stadium, but none of that is there. And the basketball arena, where most of the preliminary games were played, is literally going to be uh, packaged and boxed up and sent off to Brazil for the games in 2016. And that leaves us with the Olympic Village, which will become low and moderate income housing, which is very much needed there in that North London area. That's interesting. Yeah, I saw the, uh, the, the video that New York put together for their failed bid for, I believe it was the 2016 Olympics, and in that they also said a lot, the Olympic Village housing will basically be turned into low-income housing. So it seems that that's a common and, and maybe good use of that space. Um, Except the plaza where they converted it into prison space. I don't know what that says much about the uh, you know lo low security prison space. So you you just don't know what's going to happen there. Yeah, a little bit of a uh, of a different story there for sure. <laughs> Incredible. Hey, you know, Dennis. Interesting note. Just in the last seconds here, I was looking at an interesting chart of. Of course, you can look at what countries have won the most medals, but you can also sort it by medals per population as well as medals per size of the economy. Most medals, as of I think about a few days ago, per size of the economy. Take a guess what country it is. I'm going to guess and say it's probably our own Great Britain. No, it's North Korea. Oh, well, well, we've done very, very well. I put a chart together earlier about two, three weeks ago showing per capita just based on population. And, and, and folks are pretty pleased with the performance of the team. The problem is, is now the economy is going to grind to a halt here in the UK. There's no more construction projects because there are no more venues to be built. Right. There are no more uh, jobs to be found there. Austerity is really kicking in. We're in the teeth of a double dip recession here in the UK. So it, it's a very real issue now as we go into September and October. Plus, you still have the Eurozone contagion. What's going to happen with that? Are they going to be issuing bonds to protect the debts of Greece and other countries. Dennis Campbell, World View with Dennis Campbell every Thursday. Dennis, of course, editor-in-chief of UK Progressive Magazine. Thanks as always, Dennis. Thank you. Let's talk about today's new David Packman show, Member of the Day, of course, made possible in part by liberalbias.com. Some people do say that conservatives are anti-science, but have you ever stopped to think that maybe science is what's anti-conservative? Yet another example, Lewis, of liberal bias. Find out more at liberalbias.com. Do that. Today's David Pakman Show new member of the day is Stephen Abernathy. Stephen Abernathy, spelling his name with a PH. I have to admit, I've always been confused about the origins of with, when it comes to Stephen. 
Is there like a linguistic explanation, Natan, for why sometimes it's a V and sometimes it's a PH? Is it is it preference? I've never understood. Uh, I'm not sure. It could be that the Stephen with the uh, PH comes from like maybe a French adaptation of that the same name, and the V comes from like a German one. But I'm not positive. Interesting. What what would you say, Lewis? I would I would have to agree with Natan. If I had to guess randomly. All right. Well, Stephen Abernathy, Stephen with a PH, welcome to the David Pakman Show membership program. You can also sign up, and we'll talk about your name on the show, at davidpakman.com slash membership. Let's talk about Jared Lee Loeffner. Jared Lee Loeffner, the Gabrielle Giffords shooter from Arizona, has pled guilty to the Arizona shooting, and he's uh, received a life sentence. It started uh, in a very weird way with uh, Lofner acting in a very bizarre way. Um, uh, we'll get into some of those details. He pled guilty to 19 charges of murder and attempted murder in connection with the rampage in Tucson. The final pre plea agreement, according to Huffington Post, is he pleads guilty to the 19 counts, including attempted assassination of a member of Congress, murder and attempted murder of federal employees, and causing death and injury at a federally provided uh, activity. And as part of the agreement, the federal government dropped 30 other counts. Long story short, he's going to spend the rest of his life in prison. What do you think, Lewis? Some people angry that uh, there was no, uh, uh, that, that there is not death penalty here. You have many times said you think life in prison is actually worse than the death penalty. Yeah, I, I think the death penalty is an easy way out, to be honest. I mean, I would rather die than spend life in prison, especially if it's a rough prison and uh, you are a hated person. I mean, things could be a lot worse for you in prison. Well, okay, I'm not denying that, but Natan, he's kind of saying that he thinks life in prison is worse than the death penalty because of some of the realities of being in prison that really shouldn't be there. I mean, in other words, in theory, prisons should be safe places for the prisoners, although we know that many child molesters and others are, are, are targeted and that it have to be uh, uh, watched even more closely, sometimes segregated. But that's not really, that can't be the reason why you think life in prison is worse than the death penalty, can it? Well, if it is the reason, then if prison culture changed at some point, you would have to change your position based on that change. So, exactly. So it's like a kind of a fluid uh, position I, I, there. I think even uh, forgetting about those aspects of it, assuming it were safe, I still think life in prison is probably worse than death. According to the Washington Post, Loeffner was wearing khakis. He sat quietly throughout the hearing. He uh, smiled at one point, and uh, that was when a psychologist was testifying about his competence, and the psychologist said that Loeffner had bonded with one of the federal prison guards. That made Loeffner kind of smile, which is, which is interesting. After the hearing, Loeffner's parents cried. They embraced. The victims were mostly expressionless, as is often the case in these uh, horrible situations. I understand that, that Loeffner was uh, mentally ill, at least in some capacity, even though he was determined to be competent to stand trial. I am still frustrated, though, by the, by the fact that he was able to snap, get his hands on guns, including a, a magazine with, with 30 bullets in it, and shoot so many people up, just like James Holmes did in, uh, in Aurora, Colorado, who uh, also had an incredible arsenal of weapons at his disposal when his grip on reality was admittedly slipping. It, it is very frustrating. Is it? Don't you think? Um, I mean, it's just so common. It's common, but what I'm saying is, I, I, I think we're having a little bit of a misunderstanding. What I'm saying is, the situation of, of a person like this losing their grip on reality and becoming violent would be better if it was more difficult for them to access 30 round clips, for example. Of course, but, um, but, but that's not going to change, unfortunately. I don't know about that. Natan, do you think that it's that difficult to make it so that maybe Jared Loeffner, as we said, if he had, he was taken down when he had to reload. If he only had 10 bullets instead of 30 before having to reload, less people would have died. Is it that unreasonable to think that could change? Yeah, I kind of take the opposite position to the one that Lewis just took and say that what's probably not going to change anytime soon, unfortunately, is the fact that there are going to be people like this that want to commit these crimes. But what we could do very easily if we restricted access to automatic weapons like this is the amount of damage that they cause. We're just so... Americans are so embedded in the gun culture. It's Some just Americans. A lot of Americans. 
I would say more than you think. It could John, be. If you think about just how many people here in Western Massachusetts you know own an arsenal of weapons. Um, I guess two. Okay. I know the two you're thinking of, but yeah, the, I, I know a bunch. It, okay. It's, well, but everywhere. you work in a Hilltown bar. Still. It's still Western Massachusetts. It's a lot skew, of people yeah, wouldn't make yeah. that association. It's so. not a place where you would assume everybody's got guns, but a lot of people have guns even here. You have to assume in states that are much more at the forefront of the uh, less gun restriction argument uh, 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 debate, it's even more prevalent. You certainly. wouldn't think the gun lobby has as much pull as uh, as some of the, the bigger lobbies, but uh, I mean, apparently they do because Absolutely they do. We're, we're not seeing much change. All right, let's take a break. Facebook.com slash David Pakman show. You can also get t-shirts like the one Lewis is wearing made from 100% recycled materials at davidpakman.com slash gear. We'll take a break. We'll be back with Anna Kasparian from the Young Turks. So much more I still want to tell you about. Stay tuned. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. Welcome back to The David Pakman Show. Anna Kasparian's joining me, co-host of The Young Turks at theyoungturks.com and on Current TV. Anna, you've been covering a bunch of incredible stories related to the war on women, which now is really turning into the war on young girls, too, incredibly. Uh, there's the story out of a Louisiana public school where uh, female students, obviously female students, suspected of being pregnant, which I don't even know what that means, are being forced to take a pregnancy test or basically to leave school. Tell us about it. Well, uh, there is a high school in Louisiana. It's known as Delhi High School. And what they're doing is they're looking for teenagers that they suspect of being pregnant. They're forcing them to take pregnancy tests. And if they do test positive uh, at, for pregnancy, they immediately kick them out of the school or they put them in a homeschool program that is connected to the high school. Now, uh, I'm, I'm guessing that the reasoning behind this is they want to, uh, you know, make sure that these students are not setting a bad example for other students in the school. They kind of want to pretend as if this is a problem that they don't want to address. It's something that they kind of want to brush under the rug. And honestly, there's a shaming aspect of this as well, which I find very interesting. Now, um, I am assuming that uh, there are conservative administrators at this charter school, I should note, uh, that are uncomfortable with having pregnant teenagers on campus. But what happened to the pro-life movement? I mean, these are teenagers who have decided that they want to um, be responsible, as they would say, and carry out these pregnancies to full term. So instead of punishing them, shouldn't you create an environment where you uh, basically support the decision that they've made? instead of like shaming them and punishing them and yeah I mean really this is that this is the exact type of situation that right-wing social policy has backed itself into a corner on right because on the one hand you want to teach abstinence only on the other hand you also don't want abortions you don't want contraception either though which is known to save lives and prevent abortions so then what do you do you you kick them out and then you're not really being pro-life wouldn't wouldn't you want to embrace the fact that they're carrying the baby to full term at the same time, your argument is they shouldn't even be having sex at all. Right, exactly. Abstinence-only education doesn't work. And I think we have several case studies to prove that. When uh, George Bush was in office, he uh, defunded comprehensive sex education. And as a result, teen pregnancy skyrocketed. Now, thankfully, when Obama got elected, he looked at this and realized that it wasn't working. So he started focusing more on comprehensive sex education. And as you can notice, uh, our teen pregnancy rates are slowly but surely dropping, which is excellent. So. Another part of this that I want to focus on is, yes, there are people in this country who are genuinely pro-life, people who do believe that it is a, a life form at the moment of conception and we cannot abort that, uh, that zygote, for instance. However, um, there are people in this country that I feel are more 
focused on punishing and shaming women, right? They see abortion as an easy way out, and it's kind of like, oh, well, you had sex out of wedlock, so because of that, you need to be punished for it. You need to be responsible and have that baby, and you get no government assistance. If you're in school, you should get kicked out of that school, and you should go to homeschool. I mean, it's about punishing these girls, when in reality, we should create a support system that, first of all, doesn't get them pregnant in the first place, teaches them how to prevent that from happening. But if that does happen, and they do decide that they want to have that child, well, we should be supportive of that as well, rather than shaming them and punishing them publicly. The other issue is for people who say, oh, that's a crazy policy for this school to have. I'm glad the school I went to, the school my kid goes to doesn't have that policy. Even when there isn't this crazy policy, most female students who end up having a kid in high school do end up leaving school anyway for kind of the off the record discrimination that takes place, don't they? Absolutely. 70% of uh, high school teenagers who get pregnant actually end up dropping out of high school, and that's a huge statistic. And part of the reason why is because, first of all, they do get bullied by their classmates. I'm sure that they get ridiculed because of the fact that they've gotten pregnant. But also, administrators look down on them. Um, they convince the students that maybe they should go to another campus that uh, has pregnant teenagers. I know there are uh, certain schools that do that. But as the ACLU noted, this is actually against the Constitution. It it basically goes against something known as Title IX, and school administrators are not allowed to discriminate against students based on their sexuality or if they get pregnant, uh, especially if they're getting federal and uh, state dollars in order for that school to operate. Now, a lot of people were making the argument that this is a charter school, so maybe they're allowed to make their own policies, but that is not the case. They are receiving public funding, and as a result, they need to adhere to Title IX. This brings up questions which we've had for years more broadly about the Louisiana education system, doesn't it? I mean, we see so often people like Bobby Jindal, governor of Louisiana, criticizing what takes place in just about every other state and kind of avoiding scrutiny or at least trying to avoid scrutiny of their own states. But the Louisiana educational system has a number of problems, don't they? It really does. Right now what you see in Louisiana is the defunding of public education and the funding of the voucher system. Now a lot of people are being fooled into thinking that the voucher system is great because it gives parents the opportunity to choose which schools that their children go to and they can choose private schools. But there are a number of problems with that. First of all, the number of really, really good private schools in Louisiana are, are filled with students. They don't have enough space to take in more. However, there are a bunch of these um, right-wing Christian, uh, co uh, not colleges, I'm sorry, uh, public schools within Louisiana that do have a lot of space. But the problem with that is they don't believe in science-based research. <laughs> they uh, push the idea of creationism. And it's not really the type of education that students should be getting. They really need a uh, logical ed education, not religious education. Another problem with that is Bobby Jindal will make the argument that public schools are complete and utter failures within the state. But the reality is he's sucking money out of the public schools and he's putting it into the voucher system. So of course the public schools are going to fail if they're not getting the necessary funding to operate. And uh, you know, the final thing is parents are being tricked into thinking this is a good program because they're thinking, oh my God, look, the state is going to pay for this private school and it's going to be awesome. What do you think Republicans are going to do as soon as they shut down the public schools in the state? You think they're going to continue giving you funding so you can send your school to your kid to private school? Hell no. They don't care about your kid's education. All Not only that, but it'll become the, the, the de facto curriculum that we have. You know, traditional math is the new one that we're covering on the next segment, which is which is the addition now to the sex education we've been talking about. There will not even be an alternative to that right wing. Uh, and I hate to even call it a curriculum, but the right wing curriculum. Exactly. And it's a real problem uh, that Republicans are very much in favor of. And of course, it kind of goes to the whole issue of the unions. They want to get rid of the unions. They want to get rid of public schools. And in the meantime, they're really destroying uh, the education and the opportunities for these young kids. And I feel horrible about it. And I really, really hope that Democrats fight hard to uh, basically fund public education again, uh, keep it going, keep it strong. And I know that public education has some problems, but privatizing our education is not the way to go. Well, it's the ultimate uh, closed loop, self-fulfilling prophecy, right? You criticize that the, the public schools aren't that good. So you give some vouchers for private schools. Okay, it doesn't cover the entire private school tuition in most cases. So then only parents who have extra money to put towards their education 
pull their kids out. That means that it gets even worse for the kids whose parents can't afford to send them there, and then it makes public education even worse, furthering the argument from conservatives that we need to get rid of the public schools. It, it, in a sense, it's perfect for them. It is. It is perfect for them. And another thing to keep in mind, you know, you mentioned tuition, and that is a key word. You know, a lot of college graduates right now are having a tough time uh, creating a life for themselves, buying a home, you know, raising families because of the fact that they are burdened with student loan debt. Now, imagine how much more debt these students are going to have just because they took out loans so they can pay for their private, uh, you know, grade school education. I mean, it's unbelievable. And if, if we head in that direction, I think we're going to see a, a bigger division between the rich and the poor. Because what's going to happen is education will be reserved for the wealthiest people, the wealthiest children in the country. And those from the middle class and the working class will not have the ability to pay for education. People don't realize how important free public education is in this country. And if we destroy it, we're going to see a huge wealth disparity in the country. No question. And in part, they don't realize it because of the successful campaign that we're seeing from the right about talking about how worthless public education is, which is, like I said, self-fulfilling prophecy. Anna Kasparian, exactly. co-host of The Young Turks, theyoungturks.com, also on Current TV. The Young Turks uh, web show now, new time again, right? Now it's 9 p.m. Eastern. Yes, 9 p.m. Eastern to 11 p.m. Eastern. I come on at 10 p.m. Eastern, but you guys should definitely check out the whole show. We do a variety of really cool topics, um, just like David does, actually. I love how uh, you have a lot of variety. Sometimes you talk about the wacky stuff that we talk about, too, so it's great. All right. Thanks, Anna. Thank you. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com. The best way to support The David Pakman Show, a David Pakman Show membership. Find out more at davidpakman.com slash membership. You'll get the commercial-free podcast, audio and video of the bonus show, commercial-free full video of the one-hour television show, as well as being able to take part in Monday's first-ever member video call-in, where we're going to be taking your questions uh, right after the show, 3.15 p.m. Eastern Time open to all members. So sign up today. That's it. Brian Fisher, known to you as anti-gay Brian Fisher of uh, the American Family Association and Focal Point Radio, so on and so forth. He has tweeted out that children of same-sex couples should be saved through an underground railroad style kidnapping. Now he refers to it as an underground railroad style kidnapping. The American Family Association's Brian Fisher is really getting to a new low Lewis, I would say, with his anti-gay statements. I've actually noticed that since President Obama has been elected president, the tolerance level or what the right wingers are comfortable with as far as racist and anti-gay comments has really escalated for some reason. And I think that there's a connection there. Yeah, I mean, uh, we're close to hitting the ceiling. I mean, the next step is just talking about killing them. Yeah. And we're not far from that. We've had it already. I mean, we, we had the, the pastor Worley, Worley. Right from one of the Carolinas, I think it was, talking about putting uh, gays and lesbians in pens and then letting them die out and all this, all this crazy stuff. Yeah. Long story short, Brian Fisher was referring to, in a tweet, this horrible story about Lisa Miller, who went through the completely debunked bogus ex-gay therapy and after declaring herself ex-gay, kidnapped her daughter away to Central America to prevent her former partner from having any custody. Now, of course, the ex-gay therapy itself could drive you to do something like that. Uh, certainly we can't uh, make any, any evaluations of that. Brian Fisher thinks that the, that and one other story are perfect examples of why the children of same-sex parents should be kidnapped for their own protection. It's, in other words, they're kind of like slaves that need to be rescued made to, to use the Underground Railroad illusion. Now, of course, this is incredibly dangerous and ridiculous rhetoric which potentially could do great harm. Imagine, as we know, if you're anti-gay, you're probably less concerned with logic and reason and critical thinking than if you are uh, in favor of gay rights. That I think we've established very clearly on this show. Yes. Therefore, it stands to reason that you could very realistically be influenced into simply 
kidnapping a kid after seeing what Brian Fisher says. This is hugely dangerous stuff. Right, and somehow that this will help the kid as opposed to traumatize the kid. Uh, once again, just a complete lack of, of critical thinking. Let me take it a step further. Is advocating for the Ill illegal kidnapping of children that much different than advocating for the molestation of children if through some crazed logic you think it would actually be good for the kid? Is it that different, really? I'm pretty sure NAMBLA members claim that uh, that type of thing is good for children. Yeah, it's probably not unprecedented right. that, we, that we have people claiming that. And by the way, I know many kids who had terrible messed up childhoods and their parents were straight. Mm -hmm. Well, they were probably just in the closet, right? They were probably really gay. Well, that's got to be it. Or maybe they were ex-gay. Who knows? And it was a failed conversion. There are certainly, uh, well, has there ever been a successful <laughs> conversion? If you believe a former Navy chaplain, Gordon Klingenschmidt, he's got a 50% success rate in exercising gay demons. That's not very good, 50%. Well, it's about as good as chance that somebody might just not actually be gay that you've identified as gay. Hmm. Yeah, true. When, an, when your exorcism technique is as good as, as uh, flat out uh, chance, you have to call into question what you're doing, don't you? Perhaps he just needs to improve his exorcism skills. Intelligent design is now not even enough for creationists. Now the push is for divine mathematics. <laughs> for years, we've been seeing the right wing push the Bible into the science classroom. In more recent years, though, we've had this religiously based charter school system, which is opening up literally a war on thinking, on critical thinking. No longer satisfied with just pushing creationism or abstinence-only health education, there's a new model out which wants to look at the foundation of math itself. There's a book company called the A. Becca Book Company, and it provides a lot of the literature for these schools, okay? Now, there's a piece called The Christian Approach to Elementary Math, which was originally published in 1980. It's still used in their latest books. And this is pretty disturbing stuff. They say, we are unabashed advocates of traditional math. Traditional math. That kind of gives me the, the heebie jeebies Sounds like traditional marriage. It does. Yeah. Which, by the way, means a number of different things, up to and including nothing at all because of how it's used. Mm -hmm. That being said, they are unabashed advocates of traditional math. Only from a Christian perspective can the basic rationale be seen and, and appreciated. Traditional math will not succeed unless it's taught with the conviction that something more than arbitrary process derived from arbitrary principles is at work. This is where it gets really good. The elementary student doesn't need to understand 2 plus 2 equals 4 in order to learn it and use it. The elementary student does need to see his multiplication tables as part of the truth and order that God has built into reality. And here's the, the uh, cherry on top, Lewis. From the Christian perspective, 2 plus 2 equals 4 takes on cosmic significance, as does every fact of mathematics, however particular. This is a direct drive to undermine critical thinking. And you know what I really think is going on here? When you start to meet resistance with creationism and abstinence only, because people say, well, listen, in other areas like math, we teach this very, very differently. What do you do? You move it to those uh, categories. Exactly. You start yeah. teaching math in a different way that makes no sense either. What universe are the people that are writing these books living in? Actually, that's probably the explanation that in whatever universe they reside in, maybe math is more about God than it is about uh, uh, math. Well, I mean, I guess, I guess the, uh, the thing here is that everything is about God. Yeah. Everything. That seems to be it. Let's get to some of your email. You can email me through our website, davidpackman.com. Click on Contact Us. Papa John's announced that they would be increasing by about 15 to 20 cents the cost per order because of Obamacare. A lot of email about that. Papa John's raises food prices. Less people eat pizza and get obese. Healthcare costs then go down. Ironic? That's a very good point, actually. Yeah. Except, is Papa John's even really considered pizza? Um, I guess technically. From the legal standpoint, it yeah. is. And, oh my God, an extra 15 to, 10 to 20 cents. Yeah, like that's make or break when you order a pizza. Seriously, if that tiny surcharge is the difference Obamacare makes on a pizza, what's all the fuss about? Another good point. I said I'd be glad to pay 15 more cents if I knew everybody was covered. Right. But the last comment really uh, is, is the kicker here. Did Papa John's raise the cost of pizza in Massachusetts when Romney Care went into effect? Interesting. You know what? Uh, I don't think it did, but I really wouldn't know because I don't order from Papa John's. Right. But I've never heard of it before. That's yeah. for sure. Keep going. 
Texas man. No, 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 no. Oh, you uh, Papa that. John's founder held a private fundraiser for Mitt Romney. Yeah, we, we know that he's a Romney supporter. We didn't announce that, though. I think we did. I don't not think we the did. fundraiser part, but that right, he's right, a, not, a Romney not the supporter. Fundraiser part, yeah. Yeah. On the Texas man with the 61 IQ that was executed, I'm pretty sure 61 is average for Texas. I, I see where you're going with that. And lastly, the true valor of a person is shown not in how they treat their equals, but how they treat those below them. Well, like I said, it's not about IQ. It's about getting rid of the death penalty altogether. We'll talk to you on the bonus show or see you next Monday. The David Pakman Show at davidpakman.com.